So for a while now, I've wanted to build one of those IO-style multiplayer games, and for whatever reason, whether it be lack of time or lack of ideas, I just never really got around to it. And for those of you who are not familiar with IO games, there's games out there, things like Slither.io, Agar.io, and Paper.io, and they all have a number of things in common. The things that all these IO games have in common is they're usually all multiplayer, they're usually delivered in the browser, they're usually really fast-paced, they're usually games where they never really end. You basically join into the game and you do something and then eventually you're knocked out and you can just start over again. All these games usually have a really simple premise with really simple rules and mechanics. Like in the case of Slither.io, you, you join into this game, you're a little tiny snake, and you go around and you collect little colorful orbs, and your snake grows bigger as you find other snakes. If you can get a snake to run into you, that snake explodes, you can collect more orbs and get bigger and bigger. And the whole point of the game is just to be the biggest snake on the map. So the game that I thought up of is called Math Arena, and the premise of this game is you're a little character on a map, and you can move around that map with the WASD keys or the arrow keys. You find these circles on the map, and when you get into the circle, a math problem appears, and you have to solve it really fast, and if you're the first to solve it, then you get points. But once you solve one, you have to move quickly on to the next one, because there's going to be a lot of players on the field, there's going to be a lot of circles, and everybody's going to be trying to solve the problems the quickest to get the points. And then for every second of inactivity on the field, you're losing points. Additionally, as you gain more points, the problems get tougher that you have to solve. However, the problems for the other people stay the same. And then finally, and this should make it really competitive, is if you enter a circle and you enter a wrong answer, you become vulnerable for a few seconds. If somebody were to come into that circle and solve it while you're vulnerable, you get knocked out. And the person that knocks you out gets half your points. Now this game is not complete. I've only been working on it for about a day. So I'm going to show you how far I've gotten in one day. And the whole point of this video is to explain to you kind of the approach I'm using to build this kind of real-time multiplayer IO style game. And perhaps it could be even used for inspiration for a game that maybe you want to build. So before we jump into the technical explanation on how I got to where I'm at, I want to show you where the game is right now. So here's what I have so far. When you show up at the game, you're going to be met with this screen. It's just a little title here and then a box to enter your name. Once you enter your name, so I'm going to put Engineer Man, and then hit Enter, you're loaded into the game. At the top left, I have ping here. Of course, it's just one millisecond ping because it's local. And then I can use my WASD keys to move my little guy around the field. Now, this may not seem like much, but I also have it working for multiplayer. So if I grab a second browser and I move it over here and I add a different name like somebody else and I hit enter, then you can see that it's now on both screens. So I actually have, I, I have basically two players here. So everything I do on my screen shows up on the other player and everything the other player were to do would show up on this one. And I could keep going. I could add a third, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth player, or however many I want. And now that's all I have so far. I know it might not seem like much, but there's a lot of foundational aspects that were solved by just making this one thing work. You know, there's the real-time aspect, web sockets, and then the syncing between different clients. So next we're gonna actually discuss all the technology I used and how I put everything together to make this one little piece work. So there's really four main pieces that's being used to make all this work. Node.js, WebSockets, Redis, and React. The role Node.js plays in all this is managing all of the logic and just gluing everything together. The role that WebSockets plays is enabling the real-time communication between the WebSocket server on the back end and the WebSocket clients on the front end. This is what lets me continuously stream data to the browser so it can make the proper updates. The role Redis plays, which is perhaps the most important of all of them, is to handle what's called PubSub, which is short for Publish and Subscribe. And the whole premise behind PubSub is that certain clients can subscribe to certain things, and then certain clients can publish information to those that are subscribed to certain things. And we'll talk a lot more about that in a little bit. And the final piece is React, and the role React plays is actually rendering the field and all the players onto the screen. For those who already use React, you're probably already thinking to yourself, oh, this is definitely a fantastic option for this. But for those who have never used React before, what React excels at is taking a state made up of one or more JavaScript objects or arrays, and then rendering a user interface based on that state. Additionally, the other thing that excels at is if you change just one tiny piece of data in that state, it can efficiently update the view by just updating that one piece of data. And that happens totally transparent to you. So this basically means I can just take all the data that comes from the WebSocket feed and just toss it into the React state, and it'll just re-render everything as efficiently as possible. So the first file we're going to look at here is the gateway, and the gateway is kind of a combination of all the Node.js logic as well as the WebSocket server, and then the Redis PubSub. So for the most part, everything in the game happens by codes, and I've, I've broken these up into output and input codes. 
And the output codes are essentially events that the server can send to the client. And then input codes are events that the client can send to the server. So for instance, the client can inform the server that it would like to make a movement. So this is like when you press WASD to move around the field and the client can inform the server that it would like to set somebody's name. So that's how when I typed engineer man that showed up as engineer man. Conversely, if the server wants to inform the client, it can inform the client things like its current ping, that it just registered, it can give the client a unique ID, and then also the player state of both the player and all of the other players who are connected. So obviously as I continue building out this game and I build out game mechanics, there's going to be a lot more output codes and a lot more input codes. For the game to function properly, Node.js has to manage basically a master game state of everything that's happening in the game. So the state object more or less is an object full of games, and then in every game is an object full of players, and then every players is an object full of additional data. And the data that's necessary to keep track of per player can be seen here. Right now, it's just a few things like the name, their current position, both X and Y, and then what inputs they're currently pressing, whether it's up, left, down, or right. Now, most IO games are tick-based, and this game is no different. So the code you're seeing here is going to be the logic that's ran every tick. And a tick is nothing more than an opportunity for something to change in the game. So right now, only two things happen per tick. The first thing is that every player who's currently in the game is looked at to see if they're currently pressing any of the movement buttons so if they're pressing up then it's saying move them up 12 pixels if they're pressing down then move them down 12 pixels and then the second thing that happens is it actually pushes all of these new updates to the client and that's what causes it to re-render on the screen now keep in mind there's many ticks per second and in the case of this game there's going to be 20 ticks per second so if they're moving at 12 pixels per tick this means that they're actually moving 240 pixels per second now i want to make clear that when it goes to send all of the update information to all the connected clients it's not sending it directly to the client what it's doing is it's publishing it to redis under a channel called game one and then it's publishing it as output code player state and then the payload is the new state for all the players if we scroll down a little bit we get to this block of code and this is where the connected client has subscribed to a channel called game one and then on every message pushed to that channel it is using socket and it's sending it to the connected client now the reason it has to be done this way and the reason that i can't just send it to all connected clients at the top is because imagine we have three games going on there's going to be no way to really determine who is subscribed to what updates. So every client has to subscribe to a particular game and then it can send it to the appropriate place that way. If I didn't have this, all clients would get all updates from all games and it would just be absolute madness. In fact, it just wouldn't even work. So Redis is a really, really powerful tool for this purpose. So now that we've looked at a few of the main components on the back end, it's time to move to the front end. The first file we'll look at is the gateway connection class on the front end, and we're not going to spend too much time on this because it's really quite simple. The role of this is not really to do any logic, it's just to open up a connection to the gateway, subscribe to the different events for the WebSocket connection, like open, message, close, and error, to restart if the connection was severed for some reason, and then allows other files to basically subscribe to new messages that come in. The entire file is just 72 lines of code and it's not really doing anything fancy. Next up is the React components. We're going to look at a total of three of these. Two are pretty minor and one is really major, so we'll spend a good amount of time on that one. The first component here is really just a simple router and it handles two routes, slash and slash arena. For the default path, which is just a slash, it's going to render the landing component. And for reference, this is going to be the landing component right here. It's the area where its current only function is you type in a name and you hit enter. The HTML here is really simple. This is everything you can see in that component. And then when you type in your name and you hit enter, it sets your name into local storage and then sends you to slash arena. That's really it. Now the arena component is the big one. And the arena component is gonna be the one where you can actually move around and do things in. So in addition to the player controls, basically what buttons they're pressing, there's a number of other things that have to be kept track of, such as the player's ping, their UUID and name, the position of the field, and then the position of all the players within the field. So you might have noticed that I'm not actually keeping track of the position of the player, I'm keeping track of the position of the field, and I'll explain why that is. The reason it has to be done like this is because to you, the player, the position of your player never actually changes. You can see that no matter where I move, I'm technically right in the center of the screen. 
However, to visually make it seem like the player is moving, what I'm actually moving is the field in the background. So if a player moves to the right, it manifests as the field moving to the left. Now, this is not true of the other players. The other players are going to be rendered at the exact location they are within the field, and that's because they see their own screen, and I don't see them unless they're in my view. So looking at the actual stuff being rendered, there's a few things going on. You have the main arena. This is going to be the entire screen. So we're listening on key down and key up, and this is what we're using to tell the server, hey, I'm currently pressing the W key, so register me as moving up. And likewise, if I lift the W key and I'm not moving anymore, register me as not moving. We then render the ping. That's pretty self-explanatory. It's just a number in the top left-hand corner. Nothing special about that. After that, we're rendering the local player. That's going to be the person who's actually playing the game. And they're just rendered right in the middle of the screen with a name and points, and that's really it. Now here's where the rendering gets a little tricky. So the actual field itself is being rendered as top is calculate 50% minus the current field dot y position. And then the left is the same thing, but it's the x position. And really if we scroll up a little bit, we can see that the field x and y position is actually equal to the player x and y position. And the reason this works is because if a player is at x equals 200, y equals 200, then what this manifests as is a field which is negative 200 pixels to the left and negative 200 pixels top. So that's what's happening here. If a player is at x equals 200, then this is saying calc 50% minus 200 pixels. To help demonstrate this point, I've moved my player all the way to the top left hand corner. So I'm currently at 0, 0, which means the field is at negative 0x and negative 0y. Now, if I move a little bit down and a little bit to the right, and we'll just say I'm at like x50 and y50, you can see that the field is now negative 50 pixels to the left and negative 50 pixels up. And last but not least is the rendering of the actual remote players that are on the screen. This is going to be players other than yourself. Now putting the remote players on the screen is actually a lot less complicated because they're just absolutely positioned somewhere in the field. So if I want to get their top and their left positions as a percentage, I simply take their position, I divide it by the max width or height of the screen, then I multiply it by 100. So if the player's X position is say 2000, I take 2000 divided by 4000, which is 0.5, I multiply that by 100, which is 50%, and then I go left 50%. And then just like the local player, I also render their name and the number of points they have. So that's it for the somewhat in-depth explanation on what it took to make what sort of in the beginning seemed like a simple thing. But as you can see, a lot more work than you might have thought went into it. And then this is a lot of foundational stuff that's used for everything else that I'll develop for this game. Like everything else I build, this project is entirely open source. And there's going to be a link in the description if you want to install it and try it out yourself. I intend to make some future videos on this game as I continue to develop it out, and depending on when you're watching this video, those videos might already be available. If you have any questions or feedback about anything you saw in this video, please be sure to let me know in the comments. I'm really excited to see where the game goes, so I'm going to continue to work on it. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.